So I'll be telling you about some of the applications of machine learning, especially in healthcare settings. So I'm an assistant professor here at Stanford. So my name is James Zhou. And a lot of my group works on actually developing and deploying such the uh, AI systems for biomedical and for healthcare applications. Right? So feel free to stop me if you have questions at any point. Right? So what I want to do today is to just first to give you a few examples, right? a few case studies of like how, what, what kind of AI systems are we using and deploying in healthcare settings, and also talk a bit about you know, what are the, some of the challenges in actually building AI systems for healthcare applications. Right. Um, so the first example I want to give is actually based on this paper that we published a couple years ago. Um, it's on a computer vision system that we developed for assessing heart conditions. Right. So the idea here is that you know, there are these kind of ultrasound videos. So if you go to the Stanford Hospital, right, uh, or most of the hospitals, they will take a lot of these kind of ultrasound videos, which is looking at the human heart. Um, and we developed a system to basically read these ultrasound videos, right? And based on these videos, we assess the different cardiac conditions of the patient. And the system is also now being, uh, you know, we, we, so we developed the system, it was published, and then we spent a lot, much of the last two years in trying to actually deploy this at different parts of Stanford. For example, that's a setup that we have using this at the emergency department here at Stanford. Okay. So, so how does this work, right? Um, so if you think about these ultrasound videos, right, this car our cardiac ultrasound, also called uh, echocardiogram. Uh, so the example of this is shown on the left here, right? Um, so if you think about the, like, the heart as like a power pump, right? So the standard way to estimate like, how much power the heart is generating is actually by looking at these ultrasound videos, right? So there are actually millions of these videos that are being collected every year around the US. And the current workflow is that the cardiologist or the physician would actually look at these videos and they would try to identify you know, which frame of the video where the heart, this chamber of the heart is actually the most expanded, where it's the largest. And also try to identify the, the frame where the chamber is the smallest, right? And by looking at how much the volume of the heart changes from going from the largest to the smallest, then they can get an estimate of how much power the heart is producing, right? If you think of the heart as like a pump. So, um, so as you can imagine, that process can be quite um, labor intensive because it's quite manual, right? Because they have to go through the entire video by hand. And then once they find the frame, they have to actually trace out the boundaries of the chamber right, to figure out its volume of the, on the, of the, the chamber of the heart. Uh, and all of those steps currently is done basically with sort of manual annotations. Um, so this is where we thought like these kind of machine learning applications, especially computer vision, can be very useful, right? Uh, so we developed a system called EchoNet, right? And what EchoNet does is to basically mimic this clinical workflow, right? So it takes this input, the same kind of cardiac ultrasound videos, like the one we see here, right? So it produces like a real-time segmentation of the relevant chamber of the heart, which is the one that's shown in blue, right? And in addition, in addition to doing this real-time segmentation of the heart chamber, it also produces like a real-time assessment Right, of how much power the heart is producing, which is technically called this ejection fraction. So that's basically shown here. Uh, so by doing this, it sort of really simplifies and automates these different manual parts of the clinical workflow. So you know, I wouldn't go into too much detail of how the algorithm, the details of the algorithm, but here's like a high level overview of what it's doing. Right, so it's basically taking input these videos Right, um, and there are basically two sort of components, right, of the algorithm. It's like the top arm and then the bottom arm. So the top arm is basically looking through these videos using like a spatial, con spatial temporal convolutional network, right? So it's because it's a video, so we have both the spatial information, right, for in the given frame, how big the, the chamber is. There's also the temporal dynamical information. Right. So this is sort of a modification of the standard kinds of confidence that you probably typically have seen on like ImageNet type applications by adding an additional dimension corresponds to this to capture the temporal dynamics. Okay. So, so it's sort of like a three-dimensional convolution in that sense. Right. So it's going through that in the top and to extract the features. In the bottom, it's basically doing this real-time segmentation. Right. So it's basically producing like a segmentation of this chamber of the heart that was colored in blue. And these two arms will come together 
at the end, right, to make like a actual real-time assessment for how much power or the ejection fraction of the heart for every beat, right? Because once you have the segmentation for every, you know, every beat, right, so you can actually then try to assess the power. Right. So after it does this assessment, right, so there's a final classification layer where it's actually trying to predict all sorts of relevant and interesting, clinically interesting um, no, cardiac phenotypes, right? So there's like the probability of heart failure, or you can predict that. You can also assess ejection fraction, which again, sort of basically how much power the heart is producing. And so it turns out that we can also use the same kind of layer to predict all sorts of other functions, like liver or kidney function. Because so it turns out that see, once you know how the heart is, is doing, that you can actually learn a lot about the rest of the body. Yeah, question. So I guess like, like when we're acting about if you want something to do with sequence, you do something like the R net, right? Something that's sequence based, but here you explicitly pass in three dimensions with some time. So how do you decide that time scale? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so here if you look at these videos, right, so the heart is actually pretty repetitive. Right, you know, you know, roughly about every once a second, right, the heart will expand and then contract. So there's actually a lot of repetitive spatial information, right, which actually makes it quite well suitable for these kind of more convolutional architectures, which are looking for these, these those spatial patterns or, you know, or, or temporal patterns. Um, and here in particular, we basically are looking at um, the time scale of basically like once every second, right? So the, we get maybe around, like, I think, 60 frames per second, right? Um, and then, so for every second, then we make like a one assessment of, of like the ejection fraction and also um, the assessment of the heart condition for every individual beat, which is about once a second. Uh, and then what happens in the end is that, you know, you, you have a, for every beat of the heart, right, we get an assessment of, okay, so how much power is that heart producing and how likely the heart is to have different diseases, right? The video itself actually could have multiple seconds, right? You can actually capture many beats, right? So at the end, we actually do like an aggregation across all of those beats to say uh, holistically for the patient, then what is the status of the patient? Cool. Other questions? Great. Um, so this is the system now that's actually used and developed here using Stanford, uh, data from Stanford. And we also test the system both at Stanford and at other hospitals, right? So one of the places we tested is actually in a hospital in Los Angeles, Cedar Sinai. Um, and you know, we just took the algorithm without any modification and then just shipped it to Cedars, right? And then just see how well did it do, right? Um, and we're actually quite happy to see that even without any modification, right? On the, different hospital where they had different ways of collecting these images, collecting videos and data, right? The algorithm actually had very similar performance as it did at Stanford, right? So the AUC is quite high, it's about point, uh, point 0.96. Right. Okay, so that's the first example. Um, any, any questions about that? Okay. So the second example I want to briefly mention, right, is an application of AI more for telemedicine or telehealth applications. So what is telehealth, right? So the, in normal settings, or usually if, uh, you know, if, if you have some sickness or if the patient has some illness, right, they will actually come in to visit the doctors in person. Right? Um, but recently, in the last few years, there's been an uh, explosion of the need for visiting and having patient-doctor interactions, not in person, but through uh, you know, digital formats, right? especially without having, the digit, have, without having the patients needing to leave their homes. And so you can imagine that really the need for these kind of telehealth or telemedicine applications have really expanded, especially during the pandemic, right? Uh, so for example, just at Stanford, in Stanford hospitals, so just over the last two years, there's actually something like a 50-fold increase in the number of these digital or televisits Right, compared to about two years ago. So one of the, you know, so telemedicine could potentially be really transformative for healthcare, right? So because imagine like not having to actually leave your home and drive an hour to come to Stanford, right? So you can, it's much easier to see doctors and also make appointments. Um, one big challenge, right, was telemedicine in general is the idea that, you know, can you actually get 
sufficient information without having the doctor seeing the patient in person, right? Um, and in particular, like oftentimes, right, a lot of the information that the doctor gets is by you know, sort of visual in interactions with the patient. Right? If I actually see you face to face, then you can often examine them quite closely. Right? And that's difficult to do with, you know, when you're doing this on, on Zoom or you know, some sort of video um, visits. So, and that's really one of the big challenges of telehealth is, is in getting high quality images, right, from the patient to the doctors. Uh, and for example, at Stanford, there are actually a large number of visits that are wasted, right? So a patient will set up a visit with a doctor, but then the doctor is not able to get sufficiently good quality images from the patient, right? So, so then they can't really make an informed recommendation or informed diagnosis, right? And then they have to sort of reschedule when we turn that back into like in-person visits. So there's actually a large number of hours, both by the patient and physicians, that's wasted because of this uh, lack of quality images. So what we want to do is to basically um, you know, see, can we actually use machine learning, and so, so especially about using computer vision to improve the quality right, of these images for specifically for these telehealth type applications? Right? Because it turns out that you know, people are very good at taking photos for their Instagrams and for their Facebook, but maybe they're not so good at taking photos that are clinical quality, right? that are, i.e., like, of, in, that are informative for this clinical decision-making process. Right? So the idea is, can we actually use machine learning to guide people and help people take more clinically informative images? So that's sort of the motivation behind this um, algorithm that we developed. It's called True Image. Right, uh, which has also been sort of commercialized through Stanford. Um, and so the motivation is quite intuitive, right? So similar to how like online check, check deposit works, right? So the idea is that you know, we want something that's very simple, it could be run on, you know, on people's phones, and then it would automatically tell people like, you know, is the image that you're taking, maybe of your skin lesion, right? Is that sufficiently high quality for your dermatologist, right, for your clinical visit? If it's not so good quality, then the algorithm actually provides real-time feedback, right, guidance to the patient on how to improve the quality, right? Maybe it says that you want to zoom in a bit more, or you want to move to the, closer to the window to get better lighting, right? So it provides this real-time guidance until they get sufficiently high quality. Right. Um, so, yeah, so basically the true image algorithm is, you know, it's, uh, so it's basically runs, right? So it's designed to be run sort of at the patient's facing side, right? So that maybe, like, so the patient could be taking a photo, right, of their, you know, of their skin, and then they want to use that to send it to their dermatologist for their televisit, right? And the algorithm basically would decide, like, if the photo is sufficiently good quality, right? If it's sufficiently good quality, then that's fine, right? So the image would just go through as normal. If it's not so good quality, right, the algorithm would decide Okay, how does give a recommendation to the patient, right? Say, how do you actually improve the quality of your photo? Right? In this case, maybe it says that, okay, you need to move to a brighter lighting, right? And the patient will retake that. Uh, and if it's good enough, then you know, it's sort of passed through the algorithm. Is this a, is the setup and application clear to people? Okay, um, so a little bit more, but under the, um, okay, actually, maybe I'll just jump into the sort of the, how do we, how well does this work, right? So the algorithm, we actually conducted like a pros prospective study here at Stanford, right? Um, so prospective study means like there's actually like a real time study where we recruit the patients, they use these tools, it's almost like a clinical trial, right? So this is done in the um, dermatology clinics that Stanford operates. Um, and we tested this on maybe about 100 patients, right? Um, and it was actually quite effective, right? So by the patients using this algorithm, they were able to basically filter out about 80% right, of the poor quality photos, which are i.e. Like photos that are, um, they would have sent to the clinician, but otherwise would have been sort of useless by the clinician because they're not sufficiently high quality to actually make a meaningful informed diagnosis. Um, it's also nice that this is actually very fast, right? So on average, it takes actually like less than a minute for a patient, right, to generate a high quality image by going using this true image algorithm. 
Um, and this is sort of, sort of an example of the kinds of improvements that you see here, right? So maybe like this is like an initial image that someone would actually really would take and send it to, to their doctors to the, to the, for these telehealth applications, right? For, for these, one of these telehealth visits. Um, and you know, that true image algorithm would identify that, oh, this image has the following issues with the blur and the lighting. It makes a recommendation. And then after using the algorithm, right, the patient actually have much better image that um, now would facilitate their televisit. So this is actually being now, uh, it was tested at Stanford in, in dermatology settings, right, and it's also being integrated now into the, the Stanford medical records. Cool. Any questions about this before we move on? Yes. I know that dermatology is like probably a field that is pretty uh, like this. This is pretty useful because you can make a judgment just based on like you know, yeah. Like but beyond that, are there any other like readily convertible fields in medicine? Because I feel like oftentimes you need your doctor says to look at your, your throat or something or test something. It's like, yeah. less applicable. Yeah. So it's a good question. So I think dermatology is probably the the most immediate application of this, right? Um, there are also a few other sort of more like primary care settings, right? Where often the like doctors actually get more information just by inspecting what the patients look like and how they're how they behave. Right? So this is where it could also be useful. All right, for other settings where if it actually requires taking a biopsy of the patient, right, for more like pathology or you know, cancer diagnosis beyond uh, skin cancer, then um, then the patient will still have to come in to the visit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a good question. So, uh, so the, what the algorithm does is that it actually does incorporate quite a bit of domain knowledge. So one of the developers on our team for doing this, is she's actually uh, one of my postdocs, who's a dermatologist. So she sees patients one day a week, and we actually did our initial piloting of this in her dermatology clinic. All right. So the, for example, the kinds of domain knowledge that comes in would be. Uh, first, we actually you know, take the image and we first segment out this, just the skin part of the image, right? Because if you take an image, there could be all sorts of background, right? Maybe our furniture and chairs, and we don't really care about the quality of those backgrounds. So if you just segment out the relevant human skin, right? um, and so we identify, and after we segment out the human skin, right? And then we also try to map onto like what we think are the likely issues with the image, if there are issues, right? So oftentimes, the things that come in would be like, is the image does it have enough lighting, right? So the kinds of lighting that's required for a dermatologist is actually quite different from the lighting that's you know, from on the standard photos. So that's actually one place where often people make mistakes, right? And another place where the expert knowledge is very useful is in terms of how much zoom is needed, right? Sometimes if people zoom in too much, right, that's actually not so good because then they lose the context of the surrounding. Maybe if, they, if you just zoom in only onto your legion, then you lose the context of the uh, the neighboring parts of the skin, or if, you're, if it's too zoomed out, you also don't have enough information, right? So there's like an optimal zoom, which we get basically actually by, so the way that we train two images is actually by having dermatologists uh, generating annotations about what is like the optimal zoom from like a, a database of, of, of images. Cool, yeah, good questions. Um, so like another example that's very quickly mentioned is um, we've also been developing these algorithms for uh, using machine learning to improve clinical trials. Right? So clinical trials are like the most expensive part of, of medicine, right? Each trial could actually cost hundreds of millions of dollars to run, right? And sort of like the, really the bottleneck of this entire biomedical translation process. Right? So one place where we found that where machine learning can be very useful is in helping these clinical trial were helping the drug companies to decide what are the a good sets of patients to enroll in a given clinical trial. Because you want the patients to be that they're diverse, right? So they really cover diverse populations. And also that the drugs are likely to be safe and effective right, for that set of patients. Right? So this is basically a tool that we developed called Trial Pathfinder. Um, and 
you know, for helping to guide the designs of the clinical trials, specifically the designs of the, which cohorts of patients are eligible to participate in the clinical trial. And this is being piloted now by some of our collaborators and partners at Roche Genentech, which is the largest biopharma company. And if you're interested, the more details are described in this paper. Good. So now that we've talked about a few examples right, of where machine learning can be used in healthcare settings and where I think it's you know, having a substantial impact, I would also like to discuss some of the challenges and opportunities uh, that arise when we actually think about deploying machine learning in practice. Right? Because you know, in, in 229, we talked a lot about actually how to build these algorithms. Right? Um, and there's also a lot of interesting challenges you know, after you build them, think about how do you actually really deploy and use them in practice. So just to set the stage, I want to give you like a concrete example, which is sort of like a little detective story. Right, so here's the, the story, right? So um, you know, I mentioned these dermatology AI app applications, right? So the dermatology is actually one area where there's been sort of the most intense interest and investments in developing AI algorithms, right? Precisely because the data there is relatively easy to collect. And oftentimes these algorithms will work as follows, right? You take your photo, and then maybe of a legion, right? You can take your phone and take that photo. And then behind the scene here, there will be some sort of often like a convolutional neural network, right? Just looks through this photo and to try to classify, is this likely to be cancer or not, right? So in this case, it actually predicts that it's likely to be melanoma, so it's skin cancer. And the recommendation is that the patient, the user, should go visit the dermatologist as soon as possible. Okay, so the reason why this is useful, right, is that there are actually s several millions of people every year who have skin cancer, but they're not diagnosed until it's too late. And with skin cancer, if you diagnose it early on, then it's actually very treatable, but if it's too late, then it's deadly, right? And potentially many of these people, right, they actually could have made earlier diagnosis, uh, you know, because they all have, many of them have access to, you know, to be able to take these photos. So that's the reason why there's a lot of interest, you know, both by academic groups and also by commercial companies like Google in pushing out like these kind of AI for dermatology applications. So of course, oh yes, go ahead. One question. Um, so do you, what's the target consumer base for these apps? Is this like the ordinary patient or it's actually the doctors? Because I mean, if there's something going on your skin, I, I mean, like I think the instinct is to actually show a doctor or something like that. Like, so what, do you, what is your target base? How do you yeah. Like, uh, yeah, it's a good question. So there are algorithms that are people are putting out that are consumer facing, right? There are also algorithms that are more clinician facing. Mm -hmm. So most of these ones here are actually more consumer facing. Oh. And the reason is that to actually make an appointment to see a dermatologist could be like a three months or six month wait, wait time. Yeah. Uh, whereas uh, maybe pe people just they don't want to make a visit every time they see something because they don't know if it's likely to be serious or not. Mm -hmm. right, so that's basically for that kind of applications where there are a lot of these consumer facing algorithms are being put out. Okay. Yes? Just focusing, because we, want to, we don't want people that actually has the cancer signal but be classified as like uh, no. Yeah. Um, so that will be a good problem. Like, what, what if the app says, oh, it's like, is that possible that it's, it is a cancer, but however, it is maybe the true cancer system? Yes. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so here I'm telling you, showing you like sort of the AUC of these algorithms from their original publications and papers. And in addition to AUC, people also care quite a bit about like the sensitivity and specificity, which I also mentioned in a bit. Right. And in particular, I think the sensitivity is probably the important thing here. A sensitivity here means that if the patient actually has skin cancer, how often would the algorithm say that they actually do have skin cancer? Right. So that's actually really the important part. If you, you know, if a patient doesn't have skin cancer and the algorithm says you have skin cancer, that's not great, but it's actually not too bad, right? Because maybe they'll get it checked and they say it's, it's okay. But if you actually miss the diagnosis, then that can be, um, more potentially like more, more, more damaging to the health. Okay, so 
you know, given that there's a lot of interest in these algorithms, right, certainly we're interested in thinking about how to potentially use them and deploy them here at Stanford. Right? Um, so we actually took three of these state-of-the-art dermatology AI models. Right? They're all solving this task of, you know, given photo, predict whether it's malignant or benign, right? skin cancer or healthy. Um, and we tried, tried them out here at Stanford. Right? So if you look at the original algorithms, they all have very good performance. Right? So AUC is very high. Um, however, when we tested them at Stanford on real Stanford patients, right, the performance is suddenly dropped off quite a bit, right? It's much worse. Right? So the AUC dropped from like 0.9 to about 0.6. Okay, so that's sort of the you know, setting of this little detective story, right? So what we want to understand is, okay, so why did this happen, right? Why did these algorithms perform, perform so poorly on Stanford patients? Because we really need to understand that if we really want to be able to use this in a responsible way in practice. And just to be clear here, right, so these are actually just you know, images from real Stanford patients, right? There's no sort of adversarial perturbations or attacks down on top of these images. So before I tell you what we found, right, um, with this, say, would people actually like to guess, like, what do you think are the, some potential reasons why the algorithms performance dropped off so much when they are applied on the real patients? Any ideas? So the 0 0.93 was the performance of these models on their original test data. So the original test data also came from you know, real patients that these companies or these groups have collected. At 0 0.6 is, is the, the performance of these algorithms, right, when you apply them to actually those Stanford patients. Okay. Um, is there a time difference? Like, was the test data taken from a different time period and this one from a different time period? Okay, so that, so that could be one possible factor. Like, is there some differences, like temporal differences in the data sets? It turned out, oh, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to guess there may be a distribution uh, difference in age. Okay. Um, Stanford patients may be more like, you know, college students were in twice as many times. Maybe more concentrated there. Yeah. That's the biology that they said they have a Okay, so that's also a good idea. So maybe there's like some age differences between the original test patients and the Stanford test patients. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that's also a good idea. So maybe there's some changes in the location which drives different distributions of diseases, right? Skin diseases that are more common here. These are good ideas. Um, there's a, f yeah, a any other suggestions? Yeah? I don't know whether that's because, but well, maybe the quality of the image. Okay. Okay, so that's also a good idea. So maybe there's some uh, differences in like what kinds of cameras were used or how, how the quality of the images across these, the original test data and the data here. So these are all good ideas, but there's actually a couple of really big factors that are, haven't been talked about yet. People want to say more? Okay. Okay, so maybe there's some question about where, whether the models are being overfit or not to the original test data. Okay, yeah, so these are all excellent suggestions. So you know, we actually did sort of a systematic analysis, like an audit to try to figure out what happened here. Um, and the goal of this audit 
right? Mathematically, is that we really want to explain this drop off in performance, right? So we see about this drop off from 0.93 to this 0.6. I will want to understand like, what are the factors that statistically explain right, this difference in the model's behavior. So I actually turned out one of the, the biggest single factor is actually label mistakes, right? Uh, so what does that mean? So it, if you look at the original test data, right, the data that was used to evaluate these original algorithms right, in their initial publications, so it turned out that the, the original test data had a lot of mistakes in their annotations. Right? So what happened was that the test data were generated by having these dermatology images, right? and then they would have dermatologists to visually look at the image and say, okay, is this benign or is this malignant? Because that's relatively easy to collect. Right? However, just even having experienced dermatologists visually look at images can also lead to a lot of mistakes. Right? So the actual ground truth uh, come from you take a biopsy of the patient and then do a pathology test to say does this patient have skin cancer or not. Right, so the actual ground truth from the biopsy is basically the, the, the labels that we have here at Stanford, right? but the labels from the original test data actually had a lot of noise in them because they were just coming from these visual inspections. Right. So, and this actually explains quite a bit of the drop off in the model's performance. And this is maybe not something that's, um, that's sort of the first thing that comes to mind. Right? Because if you think about, okay, somebody built a test data set and they evaluated it, we oftentimes in machine learning, right, we just assume that, okay, the test data should be pretty clean, should be good, right? But in practice, uh, the quality of the label itself in the test data can often be highly variable, depends on the real world applications. All right, so the first question that we should always ask is, okay, so how, how good is the quality of the test labels? Right? How good is the quality of the test data? So a second big factor, which people mentioned, right, is that there is actually a distribution shift in the different types of diseases, right? So the original test data all had relatively common kind of skin diseases, again, because it's relatively easy to collect. The data here we have at Stanford had both common and also less common diseases, right, because all sorts of people come to Stanford to get treatment, right? And the algorithms perform worse on the less common diseases, right? And because of this distribution shift, it also explains to some of the drop off in the model's performance. So the third factor is that it actually turned out that these algorithms um, had significantly worse performance uh, when applied to images from darker skin patients. Right? So specifically, if you look at the, actually the sensitivity of the model, which as we said is what we really care about. Right? If a patient has skin cancer, how likely is it to find those skin cancer? Right? This, the, so the sensitivity is actually much lower when the algorithms are applied to images that come from dark skin patients. And then when we dug deeper into this, it turned out that actually the original training and test data sets had very few, and in some cases, zero images that come from darker skin individuals. Right. Um, and no, this is just, I think the overall takeaway here is that oftentimes when we look at the application of machine learning in real world, in practice, right, um, it's very difficult to interpret the performance of the model, right? So if someone just tell you their AUC, right, it's, very, it's almost meaningless unless you really know the context of what is the data that's used to evaluate that model. So here I talked about you know, the dermatology settings, but we actually did sort of similar kinds of audits of all of the medical AI algorithms that are approved by the FDA. So, so as of last year, right, there's like over 100 uh, medical AI systems that were approved by the FDA so that it can be used in um, patients. So each symbol here corresponds to you know, one of these algorithms. Right? And here I'm just stratifying them by which body part they apply to. So some of them apply to, you know, to the chest or to the heart, uh, et cetera. So there's a bunch of interesting findings we have from auditing these algorithms. But I just want to sort of highlight maybe a couple of the salient points just for today. Right? So the most interesting thing is may just look at the color. Right? So I colored each of these algorithms uh, blue if the algorithm actually had reported evaluation performance across multiple locations, maybe from multiple hospitals. Right. Otherwise, it's colored gray. 
So it's already quite clear, right, that most of these algorithms, about over 90 of the 130, uh, did not report, uh, where we couldn't find the evaluation performance across multiple locations. Right? We only see how well does it work at one site. Okay. In addition to that, right, so four out of these, only four out of these 130 devices were tested using a prospective study. Right? By perspective, I mean more like a human in the loop study, right? So they have the algorithm and they tested how well does this work, you know, uh, in a real setting with, with maybe doctors or with patients. So the remaining like, 126 out of 130 were only tested on sort of retrospective data, right? And that means that you know, somebody collected like a benchmark data set beforehand and then they applied the algorithm to that benchmark data set. So the retrospective benchmark data set could actually have come from the same hospital where the algorithm was being trained or developed. So as we saw from the previous example in dermatology setting, right, so if, if you only have data from one location that's collected retrospectively, right, that can potentially mask substantial limitations or biases in these models. Okay, any questions? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, this is actually something that we are working together with the FDA on, right? So the FDA has a quite rigorous process for evaluating drugs, right? For example, like for the COVID vaccine to be approved at the FDA, they have to run like a very large scale randomized clinical trial, right? And to show that the drugs are safe and effective. Um, the evaluation standards for medical AI algorithms by the FDA is actually quite different compared to like drugs, right? So for example, these algorithms, they do not have to be, go through like a prospective clinical trial, right? It doesn't have to be randomized in a clinical trial, right? So that's why many of them were tested on these just retrospectively collected like benchmark data sets. All right, so one of the interesting challenge going forward is, like, is to figure out what's the, FDA, like, what's the proper way to evaluate and to monitor these algorithms in practice. Okay, so now given that these challenges that we, we saw here, right, so, um, so I just want to quickly go through a few lessons that we've learned uh, or recommendations that we have for how do we improve the reliability right, or trustworthiness of these AIs, especially as they're being deployed in healthcare or biomedical context. Right? Now, based on some of our experiences from both building, deploying, and also evaluating these models. So I'll say a little bit, a couple of slides about each of these points. Right? So the first one is that I think as we saw that there needs to be a much greater amount of transparency about what data is actually used to benchmark or test each of these algorithms, right? Um, now for example, just to give you a concrete visualization of this, so we actually did a survey analysis of what are all the different types of data that are used to benchmark uh, dermatology AI models, right? So you now each Square here corresponds to one of these dermatology AI models, right? This is where people have published a paper on this, right? And so that's the squares are the, are the models for the papers, right? So the circles are the data sets, right? So the size of the circle corresponds to how big that data set is. And there are two colors, right? So the red circles are basically the private data sets, which means that these are data sets that someone could be a company or academic group that has curated, but they're private so that nobody really has access to it. And then the blue ones, um, circles, corresponds to the public data sets. So these are like the, the, the openly available benchmark data sets. Right, so for example, one here is, would be like a relatively large public data set that's often used by many of these algorithms for benchmarking. Right? And what's quite interesting is that there's actually a large number of these algorithms, maybe about half of them, right, that um, were mostly tested or entirely tested on relatively small, actually, private data sets, right? Basically, like all of those ones on the, on the top right, right? And those are the ones where it actually could be 
potentially problematic, right? Because then it's actually very hard for people to audit and to understand like, what's going on in those data and what's going on in these algorithms. So, you know, so we've been very keen to try to uh, release much more like, publicly available data sets, right? So you know, I mentioned that we're, we built this, thermal, uh, this uh, cardiology video algorithm. And actually, as a part of that paper, we have created and released, I think, one of the maybe the largest publicly available medical data, medical video data sets, right? So it has basically all of the videos that we trained and tested on, right? So we released all of those. There's over 10,000 videos along with the patient's information and annotations. Right? So this is all publicly available so that people can use this for additional research. And I think this is still maybe one of the largest public uh, data set of medical videos. Okay, so in addition to understanding what data goes to developing the models, right, so we're also very interested in thinking about you know, more quantitative ways to understand how do different types of data contribute to the performance or to biases of the models. Right, so what does that mean? Right, so from a machine learning or statistical perspective, right, Oftentimes you have your training data, right? Here you have these different, each symbol could be like one of these sources of training data, maybe data from a particular hospital, right? And then you have your favorite learning algorithm. So we're model agnostic, right? It could be a deep learning model or it could be XGBoost, random forest, right? And you have whatever performance metric that you care about in deployment. Right? It could be accuracy or some sort of loss, right? F1 score. And let's say if your model actually gets 80% you know, accuracy, Right, so ideally, what I want to do is to uh, be able to partition that 80% accuracy back to my individual training, uh, no, individual data sources of my training set. Right, so I want to say that, oh, how much did each of the data points or each of the data sources contribute to the model's performance? And the reason why that's useful is that you know, if, the model, or if the model actually makes mistakes right, in deployment or if it exhibits biases in deployment, as we saw, right, then we also want to be able to say, very quantitatively, like what specific training image or training source actually are responsible for introducing those biases or mistakes in the model's behavior. Right, so if we can actually do this end to end from the data to the model and then going back to the data, right, so then this will make the whole system much more accountable and more transparent. Okay, so you know, in a bunch of works, um, you know, with my students, we have actually developed sort of approaches for doing this, right? for exactly trying to do this data valuation. Uh, it's based on these ideas we're calling sort of data Shapley scores. So the idea here is that we're able to like sort of compute a score for each training point, right? It could be a training image, and the score will actually quantify how much, you know, how much does that uh, image contribute to the model's behavior, either positively or negatively in deployment. Right, so just use, for example, if we use our dermatology as our running example, right, so the training set could be quite heterogeneous, could be quite noisy, as we saw, right, and the models trained on this could have relatively poor performance when it's deployed in clinical settings. So the data Shapley score that we propose actually would just be like a number, a score for each of my training image, right? The score could be negative, right, if that image is somehow not informative or contains some misannotations, or introduce some sort of outliers or bias to the model. Right, so the model, if it's trained on that image, actually does worse. And the positive scores right, indicate that these are the images, the training points that are informative, such that when the model is trained on those images, they actually learn and do better in deployment. So actually try capturing some informative signals. Right, so these Shapley scores can then be computed relatively efficiently on these different data on individual data instances. And this is actually quite useful also for improving the model's reliability. Right? Because one thing that we can do now is to um, you know, weight my training data by the Shapley scores. Right? So a simple idea that we, after we compute the Shapley scores, a simple experiment that we can do is to just take the original model and just retrain the model on the same data set, except now I'm weighting each data point by their Shapley scores. So this has the effect of encouraging the model to pay more attention to data points that had high Shapley scores, right? which are, the, again, the data points that we believe are the more informative 
uh, or have like, better annotations. Right? And by doing this, uh, this actually, actually can substantially improve how well the model works in deployment settings. Right? And the benefit of this approach is that it's quite data efficient, right? because we just still have the same data set. We didn't have to go out and collect a new data set. Right? We'll have the same data set, and actually the same model architecture. The only difference now is that the same model architecture is now being trained on a weighted version of the data rather than the, the vanilla kind of training. Right? OK. So, so those are sort of you know, two, I think, quite complementary ideas. Right? Once we want to be much more transparent about where the data is coming from, right? and with the data Shapley scores, this helps us to understand how do the different types of data really quantitatively contribute to the model's behavior. And by understanding that contribution, this also gives us ways to quickly improve the model's performance. Um, so the third lesson that we learned, actually quite important, is, is actually really useful to try to really understand why does the model make specific mistakes, right? Because as a general message, if we want to ensure that the AI systems that we deploy are safe or responsible, it's actually really the mistakes that are the most revealing, right? We want to look at, because this, by looking at the mistakes, we can actually understand what are the potential blind spots, what are the weaknesses, or the limitations of the model. Um, so we developed a bunch of algorithms that try to basically provide more high-level natural language explanations right, for why does the model make specific mistakes right, as a way to teach us about blind spots of these machine learning models. Uh, so here's one example. Right? So let's say if you've actually put in this image, so the image, the true label is uh, zebra. But if you put it in, in this image, right, a lot of the algorithms, some of the algorithms would make a mistake and predict this to be a crocodile rather than a zebra. Right? And in this case, we'd like to understand why, okay, why did that happen. And this so, uh, so the explanation we provide using this tool that we call sort of uh, you know, conceptual explanation of mistakes, right, so actually automatically generates a reason for why the model made the mistake in this context. Right? So in this case, it's because there's actually too much water in the image. Right? So in other words, if the image, the same image has less water and maybe more field, right, then it would actually have gotten, the model could have gotten the correct prediction of zebra rather than crocodile. Right, so you can view this conceptual, this mistake explainer as sort of like a wrapper around you know, different computer vision you know, AI systems. Right, so it takes one of these AI systems right, and looks at the, the mistakes the models make, and then it provides like, this high-level natural language explanation for why did the model make that mistake on that input. So this is quite useful because then we can apply our AI explainer, right, this mistake explainer, to also try to explain you know, why did some of these dermatology models make mistakes on these different uh, users, on these different kind of patient Im Im image. Um, so here are actually four example inputs right, where the original dermatology AI classifier made wrong predictions. So the correct diagnosis, the correct label is written on top, and what models the predicted is written on the second line. And in each of these examples, right, so our mistake explainer so automatically provides uh, sort of a reasoning of why the model actually made that mistake. Right. So for example, in the first example, right, so we learned that the reason why this model actually made the wrong prediction here is actually directly because of the skin tone. Right. So it's, it's, it's um, uh, because of the darkness of the skin tone. So in other words, right, if the skin actually had been lighter, right, O else being equal, then the model would have actually gotten the correct prediction. In the second example, right, so the explainer learned that it's really because of the blur in the image that led to the model to make that mistake. Right? Uh, and if the image, right, the same image had been sharper, right, the explainer learned that then the model would have actually gotten the correct prediction, which is on top. So in the third example, it's because of the zoom, right? So it turned out that it's actually too zoomed out, and that's really the, the reason why the, the classifier made those mistakes. 
And the fourth example is because of, there's like too, it's too much hair in the image. Right? And just by actually understanding why the models made these mistakes in each of these specific instances, this actually gives us quite a lot of insights into potential limitations and blind spots of the model. Right here, we already learned that you know, potentially it doesn't really work well on dark skins. Uh, it really needs to have pretty crisp images. It can't be blurry. And there's a certain level of zoom that it needs in order to make these diagnoses. And also, if there's too much hair in the image, then that doesn't, uh, the model doesn't really work well. Right. And these insights are actually pretty actionable. Right. For example, you can then take these insights and then as a guideline to help the users to improve their image quality, right? So that's maybe you actually tell the human users like we did with true image, right? You want to zoom in a bit more or you want to um, you know, take sharper images, right? And it could also give us insights on, you know, if we want to collect additional data, right? What additional data should we collect in order to improve the model's behavior across these different uh, and improve their weaknesses? Right, maybe we want to collect you know, more diverse images across different skin tones. We also want to maybe collect more training data with more like, hair in it. So the last point, um, which also ties all of this together, is that um, you know, we really recommend um, that we need to have much more human in the loop analysis and testing of these AI models. Right, because if you think about how machine learning is often developed, right, um, I think it's often for optimizing for the wrong objectives. Because most of the time, right, you have a data set that's fixed, a static data set, right, and the algorithm is optimized, you know, with SGD, try to optimize for its performance on, on that static data set. Right? But that's actually not what you really care about. Right? Because what you really care about is actually how well the algorithm really works in the real world applications, which oftentimes it's not really in isolation, right? But with you know, some team of human users, especially in the healthcare setting, like most of these algorithms that top out here, right? They're not just working in isolation, but there's often some clinician who takes the input from the, takes the recommendation from the algorithm and then makes some final decisions, right? So in the ideal setting, what you would really like to optimize over is maybe some to like an SGD, right? To optimize the model's performance directly for their final uh, usage, right, rather than on their accuracy on the static benchmark data set. Um, but that's actually challenging to do, right? So to address this challenge, what we developed um, these platforms called Gradio, which actually makes it very easy to collect real-time feedback right, from users uh, at all sorts of different stages of my model development. Right, so basically it was like, uh, one line of Python code, right? We can basically create a wrapper around any machine learning model. And this wrapper also creates like an interactive user interface, right? Uh, which can then be shared like as a URL with any user, right? So if they open up that URL, then they can just interact with the model in real time on their browser without having to download any, any data or having to download or write any code, right? Uh, and by doing this, right, that makes it very easy for even for non-computer scientists to be able to interactively engage with the model, right, to test it out uh, and provide feedback on you know, of the sort that we discovered uh, that we discussed before. Okay, so Gradio is actually now, um, you know, it's recently acquired by Hugging Face, but it's still public, right? And it's also being used by basically all of the larger major tech companies and uh, the many thousands of uh, machine learning teams. It's also what we use to power some of our own like, deployments here at Stanford. So just to summarize, right, so I think these are sort of the four main le key lessons that we learned from our experiences in applying, in building and deploying and auditing these AI models. Right. Uh, and then with, I talk a lot of here about applications in the healthcare settings, but I think many of these app lessons and applications also apply more broadly in other, uh, in other domains where machine learning is being used. Okay, and all of the papers and sort of the, the algorithms I mentioned are all available on my website. And here again are the different references. Um, and I also want to thank the students that led all of these works. 
So maybe we'll pause here and then see if people have any more questions. Yeah, yeah, good. So the high level idea is that we want to estimate the impact of individual data points, right? And we do this by basically adding and removing this data point across different contexts. Right? So in each context, I basically have a different subset of my data, right? And I say, okay, so what's the impact of adding this particular data point to that subset? Right. If I add this point, does that improve my model's performance before, you know, after adding it compared to before adding it? Right. Uh, and we do this basically across a lot of different scenarios. Each scenario corresponds to a different random subset of my training data. And the reason why we do this across many scenarios is to really capture potential different interactions between different data points. Right. And then, by, then we finally aggregate across all of these different scenarios to get one single score, the data Shapley score for each individual training points. In essence, you have to retrain the model multiple times with different subsets of the data, and then evaluate that on your test to see how they attack the individual. Yeah, so in principle, if you want to do this exactly, then you need to retrain the model many times. So we, we actually came up with a bunch of different efficient, more efficient algorithms that enables us to estimate the Shapley score so without having to retrain the models. Right, so for example, in some applications, right, we can actually come up with sort of analytic mathematical formulas right, to either exactly or approximately compute the Shapley values without having to retrain the models. Yes, hi. Is this related to the like, cooperative game theory um, concept of Shapley values? That's right, uh, yeah. So the original ideas for these kind of Shapley values actually came from economics from game theory where there are the people interested in ideas of how to allocate credits right, among different users or among different participants in the game. Right? So imagine if all of us, if we solve, you know, we do a course project and we get some bonus, then how do you split about that bonus among each of the individual participants so that people uh, don't complain and that people are happy with their bonus. So it's developed in that context of more like game theory credit allocation. Um, and we extended that idea to the context of data, right? So now instead of having individual workers or participants, now if basically everybody brings their own data set, so data is what works together to train the machine learning model. Basically the performance now is basically how well does the, the bonus is how well does the model perform, right? So then we can see, okay, so how do you allocate or attribute the performance of the model back to the individual data sources or individual data sets? Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, the conceptual explanation of mistakes, the, the, the labels that it tells you, are those pre provided by the team or are those like generated actually by the model? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So, what we have is basically we have a, a library of concepts, right? Uh, like a, what we call like a concept bank. So basically, we can look at all the sorts of common visual concepts, like the concept of water, or concept of stripes, or concept of zoom and color, right? So those are OB concepts. So we create like a pretty large library of hundreds of these concepts, right? And then those, then that's basically the input into the explainer, right? So the explainers try to see, okay, so what of these concepts would actually be able to explain the model's mistakes? In cases where the concept that we provide are not complete, but right, maybe there's some texture information, right, the, that actually leads to the mistake, but that's not in our concept bank, uh, we'll have some additional ways to try to automatically learn concepts, right, in a more unsupervised way directly from the data. But most of the concepts we use are actually, you know, from these uh, large concept banks that we can just learn ahead of time. Okay, great. Yeah, and then we can wrap up here.